Okay, so welcome to the first optional examples class in uh, mathematical analysis, uh, where we're going to look at definitions, proofs, and examples using the question sheet that we've got at the front. So you don't have to hand these in, and the material we're going to cover in these optional examples classes is not examinable as book work, except in as much as it duplicates stuff that's actually in the lecture notes and reinforces that. Uh, however, we're going to do a lot of methods of proof, uh, lots of ways to think about how to find examples, so I am hoping that these will be useful. But nevertheless, somebody who works through the uh, annotated slides from lectures and understands everything perfectly and gets fluent at everything should be perfectly fine. This is just, the idea is to reinforce uh, the material and to give you practice at working with examples, working with definitions, and constructing hopefully relatively straightforward proofs. We'll have a mixture, of course. Okay, so the questions come from a question sheet, uh, which is available on the module web page. Um, I'll issue it next week. Uh, we're having a little bit of trouble with our photocopies at the moment, but uh, next week everything should be fine, and uh, you'll get uh, a copy of this sheet, more practice with definitions, proofs, and examples. And what we're going to be doing today, and quite often in some of the other classes, is we're going to be working with some particular definition. Um, and this is a definition that doesn't appear in the lecture notes. So the idea is that we can produce some definition that's not a sort of examinable definition. You can think of it as a new definition, and we're going to have to figure out how to work with it, just directly from the definition. How can you work with the definition to look at examples, check what properties they've got, prove simple things about them. So it's going to be a lot of direct elementary uh, consequences. <laughs> now, I'm going to do some of these questions straight away for you. Others, I'll sort of stop in the middle and ask for um, suggestions from the audience. At other times, I may give you a few minutes to think about something for yourself. But for the examples of classes, I think I'm going to spend most of the time doing things myself with a limited amount of time for you to think about the stuff and give me your own feedback as well. But if you do have questions, uh, please do stop me, and uh, we'll see uh, what we can come up with. Okay, so the first concept we're going to look at in these examples of classes is the notion of a sum of two subsets of the real line. So what is this? You've got two sets of the real line, A and B, and I want to say what the sum of those two subsets is. Well, here's two different ways of thinking about it but they both boil down to look at all possible things that you can get by adding something in the first set to something in the second set. Of course, it doesn't really matter which way around you put the sets because addition is commutative. But, uh, so it's a straightforward definition. How It's a way of combining two sets to give another set, but it's different from the ways that you'd be used to. It's not an intersection. It's not a union. This is a different way of combining two subsets of the real line to give you a, another subset of the real line. So you get all the sets which have to form x plus y, where x is in A and y is in B. And that's another set of real numbers. Now, if you take some specific examples, you can look at what you get. Uh, so let me just give you the example of, if you look at 1, 2, and add it to 4, 11, 17, you get all things that can be formed as a sum of something in the first set and something in the second set. So that one is you get 5 and 6 by adding 1 and 2 to 4, you get 12 and 13 by adding 1 and 2 to 11. And you get 18 and 19 by adding 1 and 2 to 17. So that's a straightforward enough concept. Now let's jump to 
a question that I think would have given trouble last year. I asked this in a more abstract form last year on an assessed coursework, and it gave a lot of trouble. So I thought we'd look at a, a pretty concrete version of it first and see how we would approach it. And this has lots of side benefits because part of this is to do with how do you prove two sets are equal. So what we're trying to prove, we'll call this, um, we'll talk about left-hand side and right-hand side here. So here's the left-hand side. And here's the right-hand side. <coughs> and we've got to prove that those two sets are equal. This is set equality. So here's some comments. To prove that these two sets are equal, left-hand side equals right-hand side, we're going to prove separately the two set inequalities, set inclusions, that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side and the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side. Sometimes you can do the equality directly, but this question, it's not a good idea to try. So we're going to prove separately left-hand side, subset right-hand side, and right-hand side, subset left-hand side. Now, one of these rays round is much easier than the other. Um, the fact that the right-hand side is the left-hand side is going to take about two lines, but even so, uh, it's going to be instructive because it will show how you prove a set as a subset of another set in case you're not familiar with doing that procedure. So, so we start with right-hand side sub to the left-hand side. And again, there are some more comments. Uh, what we have to do here is to show that every element of the right-hand side is also an element of the left-hand side, which is the same as saying we show that x in the right-hand side, and uh, perhaps x is not a good letter, let's use z. We'll show that z in the right-hand side implies that z is in the left-hand side. That will show every element on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. That will give you the set inclusion that the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side. To do that, we start with the statement, let z be in the right-hand side. And then we've got to deduce that z is in the left-hand side. OK, so let me see where do these comments finish. Um, I've got the comment in bracket there. Now the proof proper begins. Let's there be in the right-hand side. Then that means Z is in the sum of those two sets. the sum of the half-open interval from naught up to 3, excluding 3, and the half-open interval from naught up to 7, excluding 7. We apply the definition. So applying the definition, this means that z is equal to x plus y for sum x in the half open interval naught three and y in the other half open interval.
and the rest is pretty easy from that. We now have this information. We now have to make deductions from that. We'll just use the definition of those intervals. So naught is less than equal to x is less than 3, and naught is less than equal to y is less than 7. So naught is less than or equal to x plus y is less than 3 plus 7 equals 10. But z is x plus y, so... In other words, naught is less than equal to z is less than 10. So z is in the required half of an interval, which is left-hand side. OK, that's the easy way around. So why is the other way around a bit harder? Let's have a look at the other way around. We have to follow the same procedure. So this time, we let z be in the left-hand side. We have to prove that z's in the right-hand side. Uh, we have to show that z is in the right-hand side, which means it's in the sum of those two sets. And that's the same as saying that there exists x in naught 3 and y in the half of an interval naught up to 7 with x plus y equals z. And that's actually a little bit trickier because you can see that if it was x plus y in that form, well, we've already done that. If you do take x plus y in that form, then it's in the half open interval 0 to 10, excluding 10. But suppose someone gives you a number strictly between 0 and 10, how do you show that you can write it as a sum of two numbers, one in the first interval 0 up to 3, and the other in the interval 0 up to 7? It's not immediately obvious what you can do, but there are three or four different ways to do it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about whether you can maybe think of a formula that might give you suitable x and y in terms of z, that if you're given z in the interval north up to 10, can you think of a nice formula that will <coughs> produce for you in terms of z a couple of real numbers, x and y, which are in the correct intervals and which add to give you z. That's one way to do it. Um, another way you can do it, well, there are several other ways to do it, so I'll be interested to see what people try. So I'll give you a few minutes to talk about this and see if you can figure out what you might do with it. Okay, and I'm going to pause the recording so that uh, I won't record the discussions. Okay, so I've started the recording again. I thought... Uh, before I just give you this proof, I thought I'd see if anyone's got any suggestions or some cases that they can deal with. So here are some, let's see if we've got any ideas. Any suggestions for anyone? Yeah? Um, can you do A equals 10 minus Z? Right. And B equals Z minus A? Okay, let's have a look. So let's set A equals... Did you say 10 minus Z? I know. Well, let's at least have a look at it. These, we're just looking at ideas at the moment, and all ideas are welcome, because when you're trying to do something like this, the first idea you try might not work, but it, it's still, any, any idea will help, right? And get you started. So A equals 10 minus Z. What can you tell me about A? If you do that, that's not a bad thing. What sort of a number is A? Well, we know at least that... Uh, we can say something about where A is. Uh, a is greater than naught, and A is less than or equal to 10. So if you do that, 
Um, you get some information about what A is going to be. I think we're going to need a new page. Uh, so then you were going to say, what are we going to do with B? I was going to say B is Z minus A. I don't think it's going to be strict enough though. Okay, it's not going to cover all cases. If you try B equals Z minus A, um, it might even, that might be a negative number, I think. Let's get this right. B equals Z minus A is equal to uh, 2 Z minus 10 might be a negative number. So at that point we might get a bit stuck, though I still think that looking at 10 minus Z is quite a nice, it's quite a useful number to have around, you might be able to use it. Well, I, I'm not quite sure where we're going to go next. Well, what did you want to try next? If, I don't know. What, what, I tried 8 and 6. I'm just trying out values of Z. Oh, I see. But then you want to... So then what were your two numbers that you were going to add to get a Z with? Oh, A and B. A and B. Oh, oh, okay. So then A plus B equals Z. Okay. And so sometimes this will work. And sometimes... So this will deal with some of the cases, but it might not work every time. Okay, but it's, a, but it's a good idea, and, uh, but the question is, would they be in the right intervals? Um, so sometimes, uh, so well, sometimes, but not always. So I think we haven't quite. Yet. So what you could do is you could say, in certain cases you can do this, but in other cases you're going to have to do something different. Um, there are a lot, actually, quite a lot of different proofs that do case by case analysis that say if Z is here, then this will work. If Z is somewhere else, then something else will work. Um, any. Uh, so I'm I'm quite interested in any cases that people have looked at which which have worked. Any other special cases that people have looked at? Yep, at the back there. Um, if Z is between 0 and 7, not including 7, then X equals 0 to the right. Yeah, so that's a good one. That's a good one. So that's a case if 0 is less than equal to Z is less than 7, then you can take X equals 0. which is in the interval 0, 3, and <coughs> y equals z, which is in 0, 7, and uh, z equals x plus y, and that's a tick. Okay, so that deals with the case where z is between 0 and 7. So that's, and you can do a similar one if, if z is between 0 and 3, but that would also be covered by this case as well, but it would mean you could do it either way around. Okay, so that's good. Um, and uh, <coughs> you have to deal then with the case where Z is greater than 7. So what if 7 is less than or equal to Z is less than 10? Perhaps the previous proof works. Um, but it depends. I think 2z minus 10 might be just too big um, for A. The two, in this case, suppose, it, let's have a look, 2z minus 10 is going to be at least 4, so it might be too big. Um, but uh, there are things we can do. Okay, so you can investigate this case separately. Anybody already know how to deal with that case? Otherwise, I'll leave it as an exercise to think about what you what you could do. Y equals seven. Okay, if you if you take y equals seven, it almost works, except that it's not quite in the right interval. So it's a good, it's a really good try, and it actually does solve one of the problems later in the uh, list. So you can try 
y equals 7, x equals 10, uh, x equals z minus y. Then x is in the right thing. x uh, is greater or equal to naught, um, and x is smaller than 3 because um, that is smaller than 10. So x is in the right place, but y is just wrong. Y has hit the edge of the interval, and we've just failed. It's so close. Uh, what have I done there? So it's infinitesimally wrong. In fact, you can fix that by adding, <coughs> adding a tiny number to that x and subtracting that tiny number from y. All you have to do is take a number small enough and prove that that works. And so this can be fixed. Um, for example, you could set delta equals a half of uh, 3 minus x. That's a half of the way from x to 3. That's greater than naught. And uh, you can you can replace x by x plus delta and and y by seven minus delta above, and it works. Uh, so there's a way to fix it, okay? That would do it. Um, I'm going to give you another proof, another way, which gives you a formula. I actually, pref I actually quite prefer this one because it really thinks about what's going on. But I'm going to give you another one, um, which is perhaps slightly more straightforward. Let's uh, draw the interval from north up to 10. Z actually isn't going to be equal to 10. Um, but let's split it up in the ratio uh, 3 to 10. I'm not sure if I've got this to scale. Um, and now we've got Z in there somewhere. So I haven't quite used the same intervals, but I've split this up into an interval of length 3 and another interval of length 7. And you can see that there's a 3 tenths, 7 tenths ratio in there. So we're given naught is less than or equal to z is less than 10. We can set x equals 3 tenths z and y equals 7 tenths z. And what happens? Then, of course, naught is smaller than equal to x is smaller than 3, because you just multiply the inequality by 3 tenths. Naught smaller than equal to y is smaller, to, uh, smaller than 7. And x plus y equals z. And so you finish. Okay. So that's the that's the quickest solution, but you have to have an idea to have it. Whereas the other solutions are longer, but involve thinking about the case-by-case -case analysis and what there can be, and it's not quite right. You have to push it a little bit with a delta and, and things like that. So um, I don't know which is the easiest proof to find, but uh, 
You can now see, oh, I should say uh, at this point, so we now know that left hand side subset of right hand side and right hand side is subset of left hand side. So equality holds and we finished properly. Okay, well, that was question one. We spent a long time on that, but I think actually it's quite an interesting question. Uh, so that means that I'm not going to spend lots and lots of time on these other ones, but let's have a just quick look at them. Question two is an abstract version of question one. It says that no matter which lengths you take, um, R and S, positive, you get the same sort of thing. If you add the two closed intervals, you get the closed interval where you add the R and S. And if you add the half open intervals, you always have to add the R and the S um, when you're going from naught up to R and adding it to naught up to S. And of course, in each of these cases, uh, in each of these, left hand side subset the right hand side is always easy, and right hand side subset the left hand side uses the formula before uh, a variant of it. So, so all I say about these is for these uh, left hand side of the subset of right hand side is easy <coughs> and right hand side subset of left hand side can be done using the formula x equals r over r plus s z and y equals s over r plus s z so it just generalizes the proof we had before so that's the abstract version uh, uh, exercise fill in the details but you'll find the proof is exactly the same as before But it's more abstract, so perhaps looks harder. But it's, no, it's not really any harder. You still have to have the same idea as before, and uh, you can tackle it that way. OK. So let's not go through the details of that. Uh, the third question says, I just want to make sure people know that A plus B is not the same as A union B. Uh, they're almost always different. In fact, the other questions, uh, the rest of the questions, involve finding those rare cases where they're actually equal. So when is uh, A plus B not the same as A union B? Well, we already gave an example at the beginning. So our first example today. So most examples work. For example, see the first uh, examples we looked at today. In fact, everything we've looked at today. So if you're given a question like that, you could just try a couple of random sets to start with. And in this case, um, it pretty much everything works. You might do what happens if one of the sets is empty. And in fact, that also will give you an example. And because if either A or B is empty, then A plus B is empty as well, because there's nothing that can be written as a sum, something from one and something from the other. So for interest, um, if A or B, or both, is empty, then A plus B is empty. So that's a, another easy way to do it. Uh, 
because there's no way to add something from A to something from B because there isn't anything in one of them is empty. But the empty set's often a weird example anyway, so it it's always feels like cheating to use the empty set. Okay, so then, how can they ever be equal? So let me give you a couple of minutes to see if you can think of a pair of sets A and B where A plus B does turn out to be equal to A union B. So you just have to fiddle around a bit and see how can you do it so that it actually comes out equal. And uh, you should find it an example fairly easily. But the next, if you've done that, you might want to look at the next question, which says find infinitely many different pairs. So, um, so that A plus B is equal to A union B. You might want to think about all the different ways that you can do that. So I'll give you, again, I'll pause the... Or the, I'll pause the recording for a couple of minutes and we'll just see if anyone comes up with any examples. Just try stuff and see what happens. Okay, so I know some people have found some examples. Who wants to tell me an example they found? Anyone willing to tell me one? Okay, everybody's gone quiet, but it doesn't matter. Um, a lot of people came up with the idea that if one of the sets was just as it had just zero in it, then this might be easy. So if A has just got zero in it, then A plus B is exactly the same as the set B. Now we want it to be A union B, so that will only work. So this will be A union B as long as A is a subset of B. So B can be any set which has got zero in it. So, specifically, for example, you could take A equals zero, B to have just zero in as well, and A plus B has just got zero in, and that's equal to A union B. And, of course, you can use this to solve the next question as well, to give infinitely many. That's a bit boring though. So perhaps you could think of some examples where um, you don't use zero to get the answer to this. So can you find examples without using zero? Did anybody already come up with an example that didn't involve zero? <coughs> yes? Can you have them both being the even numbers? Both being the even numbers from, but starting from where though? Uh, all of them? Yeah, all the even Well, that would do fine, okay? Um, of course, it, when I say doesn't involve zero, I, I mean, you, zero is in there, but you're not really cheating, right? So. Uh, So you can have A equals B equals what I call 2Z equals the set of all even <coughs> integers. Okay. 
uh, then you can find easily that uh, every even integer is the sum of two other even integers in quite an easy way. You can use naught, but you don't have to. And of course, if you add two even integers, you still get an even integer. Then a plus b equals 2z equals a equals b equals a union b. So that works as well. Okay, so that's perfectly good. Um, so what you, you can do for fun is think about what other examples you can get and what sorts of sets might be very useful for producing examples like that. But uh, that's just messing around with examples, definitions, and you can see that uh, even though probably before today you never saw the definition of a sum of two sets, you've already seen you can take a new definition and you can fiddle around with it and mess around with it and you can prove things and you can find examples. And it's not as bad as all that, even though you never saw the definition before. <coughs> Some bits are more tricky than others. Well, we're going to be doing lots more of that sort of thing in these optional examples classes. And uh, I'll stop the recording there.